The first ever recipient of the Templeton Prize in 1973 was Mother Teresa. The prize, worth almost two million Canadian dollars, honors a person who's made, quote, an exceptional contribution to affirming life's spiritual dimension. The most recent recipient is Marcelo Gleiser, a theoretical physicist who specializes in cosmology, high energy physics, and astrobiology. And while a nun and a theoretical physicist may have little in common, it's not as big a stretch as it might seem. Marcelo Gleiser is the Appleton Professor of Natural Philosophy and Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Dartmouth College, and the 2019 Templeton Prize Laureate joins us now from Hanover, New Hampshire, for more. Uh, great to have you with us on TVO tonight, and congratulations on your honor. That is really terrific. Well done. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here with you. Let's talk about the fact that you study the nature of the universe through the language of mathematics, and some people will wonder whether or not there is room for spirituality in mathematics. What do you think? Well, um, there are different ways to answer that question. If, if you just take pure math, okay, pure mathematics, it turns out that the people that just do pure math, meaning mathematics which is not applied to describe anything directly related to nature, so just number theories and different theorems that don't really apply to anything necessarily connected to reality, they would say they're all like Platonists. You know, they believe that truth is in the world of ideas and that they can pluck those little truths through their uh, thinking and through their research. And in a sense, they are connecting, some of them say this, others do not, to the mind of God, in a meaning, meaning a God here is a metaphorical God representing the mathematical uh, blueprint of reality. So that's sort of the pure math. In my case, which is not pure math, which is where we physicists are trying to engage with the big questions of existence through science. So for example, the questions that we're dealing with are questions like, what is the origin of the universe? What is the origin of life? Can we reconstruct the history of the universe from the Big Bang until nowadays? Uh, is there free will? So questions like this are questions that go beyond the more App, uh, more applied science like can I build a microchip to construct a faster iPhone? These are questions that have been part of the conversation humanity has had with a bigger dimension than we are, which I like to call a spiritual dimension. And uh, so the connection here with spirituality is like I like to say uh, that in a sense science is a flirt with the unknown. It's all about what we don't know of the world, of ourselves. And so I like to picture us in an island and we are surrounded by mystery. And it is this engagement with the mysterious dimension of existence, which science can help us probe in some ways, that I consider a very spiritual connection with the world. That is a lovely metaphor. We did check the website of an evangelical organization uh, which announced your prize winning, and the headline was, Science uh -huh. Does Not Kill God. Would that be an accurate shorthand of your ideas about science and religion? Uh, wow. Um, well, if you really want to compress things to a very short amount of <laughs> bytes, yes, uh, you know, because that's the danger of, of compression of information, right? You can definitely kind of lose a lot in the context here. But uh, yes, I think that's, that's an accurate description because um, it is, to my understanding, um, sort of almost ridiculous, really, to say that science has anything to say about God. Um, science has nothing to say about God. Science is a narrative that we construct to explain what we can of the natural world. And we do that because we build very precise instruments that I call reality amplifiers. You know, they amplify our view of reality, letting us see more and more into this mystery that surrounds us so that we can probe into that darkness and make sense of faraway galaxies, of little particles of matter, of diseases, etc. But it cannot say anything about God in the sense of is the more we understand about the world, the less God is necessary. This sort of questioning or position 
which has been in theology known as the God of the gaps, right? The idea that, hey, what we don't know of the world, we attribute to God, and um, that is a very bad theological position, and the theologians nowadays know this because clearly science does advance, right? So we do know more about the world. And then if you would put God in our ignorance like that, God would be very, very squeezed into very small volumes, you know, which is not a very dignified position for God to be in. So what we want to say, which I think is more accurate, is that science cannot either prove or disprove the existence of any kind of deity, right? And I'm very careful about what you mean by God, because if you go around the world and you ask different people what they understand by God, you're going to get very, very different answers, right? So if you go to the Amazon, the Anomami Indians, you know, natives, they are going to have a very different conception of the divine than, say, uh, an Episcopalian uh, Christian from, from New Jersey, right? Mm -hmm. So the point is that we, we humans have a reach into the spiritual, which is very varied, it's very diverse, and science cannot essentially rule out the existence of God through our observations of the material world. What you can say, if you want, and that's a personal choice, is you may not believe in any evidence towards a deity, right? So you may be um, what I call myself an agnostic in the sense that, you know, I don't see any particular direct evidence for the existence of a God, but on the other hand, I cannot use what I know of the universe to disprove that existence simply because, and this is a position that brings out the humility that we should have towards what we know of the universe, simply because we don't know enough and we'll never know enough. There will always be stuff that is outside our reach, outside the reach of our instruments, outside the reach of our mind and ideas. And so it is, in a sense, very arrogant if a scientist, based on what we now know of the universe, which is a lot, but still just a little, to actually, based on that sort of amount of knowledge, to say, God doesn't exist, this discussion is, is useless, let's close it. So I guess my position is a much more open-minded, receptive position, which does not see the direct evidence for divine uh, interference in the world, but on the other hand, does not rule out and demean and offend the, peoples that do, the, the people that do have faith. Well, in fact, I think you go even further than that, where you've sort of looked at people like Richard Dawkins and said they irk you because of their certitude that God does not exist. Have I got that right? Yes. So when the prize was announced, I gave a few interviews in which I mentioned that in my opinion, radical, uh, sorry, in my opinion, radical atheism is inconsistent with the scientific method. And a lot, of, a lot of atheists got very upset with me because of that, because how could you say that? And, and what I mean by that, first of all, you know, there are many shades of atheism here, right? There are the very radical evangelical atheists that I guess I would include the early Dawkins, not perhaps the current Dawkins in this gang, where um, you basically deny the existence of God, period, right? And to me, that sort of radical denial is what I would call belief in non-belief, right? You're sort of like making a statement based on your belief that something doesn't exist. And how could you do that based on the scientific method whereby everything that you make a statement of should be verified empirically? So. If you don't have evidence, right, the absence of evidence, as Carl Sagan used to say, is not evidence, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So the fact that I cannot measure God in the universe doesn't mean that I can rule it out because I cannot measure everything that exists in the universe. And most atheists understand this, obviously, and are very okay with that, but if you are going to deny categorically the existence of any kind of God based on what you know of science, and you're going to call those who believe in God uh, delusional or worse, 
I think that position is a position of arrogance that brings nothing but more conflict and polarization. Well, do you think even worse it may have needlessly uh, provoked an anti-science attitude among religious believers in the United States in particular, for example? Yes, I think that's exactly right, because, again, it goes back to the, oh, are the scientists then trying to kill my God, right? And it's really not just in the United States. I have seen similar uh, positions in Europe and where I grew up in Brazil as well, where people say, what are these scientists trying to do? You know, why are they meddling with my faith? You know, one thing that upsets me a lot is I grew up in a country where I saw a lot of poverty and what I called what goes beyond poverty, misery. And I also see, and I saw when I was growing up, the appeal that religious groups have to these people, right? So they go on Sundays to their churches, not just in search of God or belief, but they go in search of community, in search of a more dignified kind of life. And so if those white males from, you know, these Anglo-Saxon white males want to just dismiss completely the role of religion, you know, even from its social importance, because there is a lot of social importance in religion, because what they think about the world and about science rules out God, then yes, I must disagree with them. Hmm. And yes, they are radicalizing even more something that I am trying to bring together, which is a constructive engagement between the people uh, that believe in, in, in some sort of, uh, of God, some kind of religious belief in nature, and a more scientific, more materialistic viewpoint. Having said all that, do you think that the story of the Big Bang, uh, the creation of time and space out of nothing, is as magical as God deciding to create the universe? Well, <laughs> magical is a very, very, <laughs> very, very strong and dangerous word, okay? What we can say is the following, and this is really beautiful, right? So if you bear with me a second here. So in the last 50 years, okay, cosmology and particle physics, ha we have reconstructed the history of the universe from tiny fractions after the beginning of time, meaning uh, the Big Bang, right? all the way to nowadays with in incredible precision. We know when the first stars were born, we know how planets are born, we know all about galaxies, we know about the expansion of the universe, we know the composition of the universe when it was a very, very tiny fireball of particles like electrons and protons and even before that. So we have done a beautiful job, I would say, you know, kind of trying to understand the history of creation from a scientific perspective. What we have not done and what cannot be done with science, and that's probably where you're using the word magical here, is to use what we know now of physics and mathematics to actually explain the moment of the origin of the universe itself. Okay, so basically this is a problem that is a very, very old problem in philosophy and theology called the problem of the first cause. And the notion is, when you do science, right, it's all about cause and effect, right? You kick the ball to score a goal, right? I guess in Canada you say you kick the hockey stick, you kick the puck with the hockey stick to score a goal, <laughs> right? And so there is a cause and effect kind of chain that goes all the way back. If you start asking, who am I? Oh, I'm Steve, and I had parents, I'm in Canada. And you go back and back and you start asking questions, you're going to hit wanting it or not, the first question. Okay, the question is, okay, where did everything come from? And that is the question of the origin of all things. And that is a very difficult question indeed, and I would say that it is perhaps the most difficult question we can ask, and by the way, have been asking for thousands of years. And so religions come up with a supernatural entity, right, that goes beyond the boundaries of space and time, God or gods, they have the power to enact change within space and time to create the universe. So science can't enact, you know, some, use some supernatural influence that goes beyond the laws of nature to do something. And so the problem with science is that we cannot explain how did the laws of physics emerge how did space and time emerge from nothing? All the theories and models that we have depend on a bunch 
of assumptions on what we call a conceptual framework that uses notions as space, as time, as energy, as laws of nature. And so the question becomes, OK, where does all that stuff come from? And that science is unequipped to do. So we get stuck with this problem of the first cause to try to explain the origin of all things. But we do really well once you assume the universe is here and it's very young and very hot and dense and how it evolved to become what it is today. So not a bad deal. Not a bad deal, but so, yeah, I mean, you acknowledge science can't answer that first question yet. Do you suspect it ever will be able to? Not the way we frame science nowadays, right? Because science needs the separation between observation, what is observed and what's being, and the observer. And it's really hard to explain the universe because we can't step outside of it, right? It's not like we can't step outside the box, meaning the universe, because the box is all there is, right? So it's very hard for us to make experiments with baby universes to understand, you know, how could you create a universe out of nothing and stuff like that. So the way science is constructed nowadays precludes a complete answer to the question. So what we can do is we can build models, and this has been done for the last 30, 40 years or so, create models based on some mathematical and physical ideas that would be at least consistent with what we know of the universe today. But the question is, OK, where do the ideas from these models come from? And this sort of metaphysical questioning doesn't belong in the way science uh, is, is constructed. So you may say, aha, uh -huh. does that mean then that you must use God to invent the universe, to create the universe? And that is, to me, a very subjective choice, right? You may say, yes, you want to go and you, you, you invoke some God to do that. Or you may say, no, I am going to live with the mystery. I'm going to live with the fact that we humans are limited uh, creatures that can make sense of a lot of things but cannot make sense of everything and basically embrace the fact that we don't know as the great trigger for us to search for more and more knowledge. And that is perhaps my position, right? The position where you want to embrace what I call not knowing and accept the fact that we cannot have all the answers so that we can go wake up every morning with a smile on our face and say, all right, let's try to figure things out today. So you want scientists to, uh, to, to have the humility to accept the fact that there is mystery in the world which we may never resolve. How well do you think scientists do humility? <laughs> well, you know, scientists are humans like everybody else. And you know, humility is not very big in politics and in law offices and places like that. And I think it's really related to our human nature. But we are working on it. And I would say that there is a growing movement now in sciences whereby people are beginning to accept the fact that to understand that science has limits, that we cannot know everything, that there are what I call unknowables out there, does not take away the power and the value and the credibility of science to explain a lot of stuff about the world and about ourselves. So the fact that science has limits about understanding the origin of the universe, or even perhaps the origin of life, doesn't mean that we don't understand climate change or the use of vaccines. These are two completely different conversations. And so my work is to make sure that people understand that science has limits, but those limits are applicable in, in areas that have nothing to do where people are kind of uh, uh, attacking, let's say, the credibility of science nowadays. Understood. Let me go to an interview that you gave to Scientific American a little over a year ago, and you were asked at the time whether you have a utopia. And I'm going to read a little excerpt of what you said to Scientific American. My utopia, you said, is that in the next decade, we are going to see a rebirth of our humanity, a moral uprising where our relationship with life, human and all other creatures, and with our planet will become the new universal moral imperative. We need to change and fast the way we eat and the way we relate to our planetary resources. In my utopia, this will still happen in my lifetime. I don't have to tell you that in this day and age, there are many people who think getting from 
A, where we are now, to B, which is where you'd like us to be, is impossible. How do you see us getting there? Yeah, um, I don't like the word impossible. You know, I think um, we have to work for it, and, and you cannot give up, right? So, in fact, the more entrenchment you see in the positions that go against what you just read, the more you should be impelled to kind of talk to people and explain to them that this is the only way out, right? Uh, we just got um, a report commissioned by the United Nations about the incredibly fast loss of biodiversity on this planet being caused by human action, right? And you may have two options here. You may close your eyes and say that this is nothing, that it doesn't matter, or you may open your eyes real wide and realize that this is happening now and the, and the uh, world that this generation is going to live behind for the next generations is a much worse world than the world we found when we started. And I think that's untenable. You know, I think that the role of each generation is to live behind a world which is better for those that follow us, for our kids and grandkids. And what is happening right now is that we are losing control of how we deal with nature and its resources. And what we need in order to change this is not just the reports, but we need to internalize emotionally, emotionally what this means. And we have to get and transform our rational understanding of this loss into a sort of heroic quest for change. And the only way this can be done is if we really understand the costs, the emotional and social costs of what's coming up. Right? And how do I do that? Well, I tell people this story, but I also explain to them the value of our planet in a more cosmic sense. So the more we understand our solar system and the history of life on Earth, the more we understand how rare this planet is, how rare life in this planet is, and how many obstacles life had to go from point A, no life, to point Z, us being here, in order for creatures, which are stardust, which is what we are, endowed with self-awareness, to understand that we need to do something to change our course of action. So we, the moral imperative that you mentioned on that interview is the moral imperative of understanding the sacredness of life and of our planet. Because if we don't do this, we, are, we need to act as a species, not as this tribe against that tribe, the conservatives and the liberals and the, and the people of different colors and different religions. This is beyond all of this tribal warfare. This is about us as a species together trying to save the planet, protect life, so that our next generations can enjoy the kind of beauty and the kind of health that we have enjoyed for the last 70, 100 years. I guess, though, Professor Gleiser, my job requires me to push back a bit on your optimism here because, and I'll just give two examples, you know, the occupant of the White House right now has called the media the enemy of the people. He, he almost relishes his anti-intellectualism. He relishes his um, ignoring empirically provable facts uh, which don't suit his particular narrative. In your home country of Brazil, your country of origin, uh, the president there has just initiated attacks on universities as well. If, if getting, you called for a rational understanding. We seem to be living in times where rational understanding is rare and is not on the upswing. So what justifies your optimism that we have a shot in this fight? Um, it's because you mentioned radical, uh, rational understanding. And what we need to do is we have to turn this emotional. We have to make people understand the suffering of other people, and, in, and, and not just understand, but see it, understand the suffering of animals and the planets. And yes, you're right, we do have two uh, leaders in, in the United States and in Brazil, and unfortunately in other countries as well, and the hard right is on, on, on rise in Europe. Um, but you know what? Governments come and go, and we do have leaders like you have in Canada or in Germany or in France that think very differently from the leaders in the United States and in Brazil. And my hope is that they will go and the new leaders, the ones that are going to be elected by the people that are going to inherit this planet, are the ones that are going to have the vision 
and the humility and the generosity to enact change and not just to increase you know, financial gains of those that already are in power. And so this is my, my optimism. And if I lose that, then I lose faith in humanity. And I will never, ever lose faith in humanity. Hmm. Marcelo Gleiser, the 2019 Templeton Prize winner, it was a real treat to have you on TVO tonight. Thank you so much for joining us on the line from Hanover, New Hampshire. My pleasure. Thanks, Steve, for having me again. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.